Okay. It is seven o'clock and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good evening. My name is Marcia Ellis and I am president of the Fort Lauderdale Broward branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. This is our general membership meeting for the month of May. We have a lot of business to take care of, so we are going to get started. And as always, we will start with prayer from our own Religious Affairs Chair, Minister Bridget Edwards. Minister Edwards. Thank you, Madam President, and to all assembled, let us go to the throne of grace. Most gracious, eternal God and Father, we give thanks to you for yet another day, another opportunity that we might gather in your holy and precious name. We beseech you now, Father, asking that you and your presence would be with us on this evening. We ask you, Father, to lead and to guide and give clarity of speech and purpose and vision to all of this evening's participants. And God, your word tells us in all of our getting for us to get understanding. And may we receive a better understanding on tonight. We ask it all in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Minister. And so this week has been certainly a whirlwind. You all may have known, hopefully you do know that the NACP uh, National Board of Directors voted to issue a travel advisory. The travel advisory um, process is as follows. Members of our uh, Florida State Conference State Executive Committee voted unanimously in the month of March to ask the board of directors to issue a travel advisory for the state of Florida due to all of the hostile and racist litigation uh, laws that are coming out of Tallahassee. Uh, we know that it didn't just begin, it, it began from the moment he took office. And so for those reasons, and because they, we have been negatively affected in our community for sure, uh, we, um, asked, we, we asked the board and on Saturday, um, they uh, granted the approval. Um, what that means is, is uh, it is a travel advisory. It is not a travel ban, it's not a, it's not a boycott. We're not asking you not to come. But if you decide to come here, you need to know what you're going to face once you get here. So it is a, a warning so that folk will know what, it ha what is really happening in Florida. It is also a call to action for all of us. The question is, is this how you want your state to look? Do you want the erasure of black of African-American studies and black history in your schools? Do you want um, a ban on nonviolent protesting? You know, you all, uh, we need to make sure that we are together. I can say that we had a partners meeting last night with the leaders of all of the Divine Nine, and yes, even the IOTAs um, and their Grand Polaris, um, all, and let me just say that they are all in. Um, don't get stuck on the travel here. And we know that the Kappas are coming and the Qs are coming and so on and so forth. Uh, nobody's being asked not to come and to cancel contracts and lose money. But all of those groups that are coming are standing with us and want to know what can they do? Because we know that other bad bills uh, have uh, been passed and are being signed. And so this is a wake up call. It is a call to action for all of us across the nation. Um, I have asked, and she has joined our own uh, president, my counterpart, uh, Madam President Daniela Pierre. So you'll be talking to Miami Dade as well, um, because this is, uh, um, Senator Osgood, this is a serious matter. And so we wanna make sure that uh, we, we do that. We, we let folk know that we are about the business. And so with that, I am going to ask, um, um, uh, Senator Davis, introduce yourself. We have we have uh, filed joint custody um, <laughs> with uh, Duval. They're fighting us on it, but uh, that's how much we care. <laughs> and then we'll go on to our own um, Senator Senator Davis. If you would. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. I am Tracy Davis, Senator of the Fifth, fifth District over here, and in, in Jacksonville. And um, I, I don't feel like I'm being taken custody of. I feel like I'm a part of the family when uh, my Broward family 
calls me to be a part of the conversation. I'm always elated um, to be here and I'm here to discuss parts of this uh, election bill that the governor um, <laughs> so ironically signed today and um, just want to get out all the information that we possibly can to make sure that we are continuing to engage and educate and motivate um, our people uh, to get out and vote. So I'm always here to do what I can and to help in that effort. Thank you, Senator. And this is uh, our Senator, uh, who we will never share custody with, just so <laughs> you know. <laughs> I can say, uh, Senator, I just got a call from uh, Marion County um, wanting to talk to you, but I am screening your calls. I'll, if you, I said, you tell me what you want, and then I'll ask her, and then I'll call you back. Uh, my counterpart in Marion County calling down here uh, for my senator. And that goes for you, Ma Madam President Pierre. Uh, we will not be sharing. you got your own. So, you know, just want to know what kind of business we're doing. Uh, but our own uh, Senator, uh, Reverend Dr. Rosalind Osgood, Senator Osgood. Thank you, Madam President. I am Dr. Rosalind Osgood, the proud senator for Florida District 32. I am a life member of the Fort Lauderdale Broward branch of the NAACP. And it is always good to have these opportunities to share correct factual information. You know, we are in post Donald Trump era. Mm. So fake news can become very prevalent if we're not having these forms. Thank you, Madam President, for your leadership and your commitment to making sure that our community is informed with factual information. What Senator Davis did not say is that she formerly worked in the supervisor of the elections office. It was a pleasure to work with her in the Florida Senate during this legislative session. And Judge Holmes, I love you, but it is a great time in the Florida Senate when you have three black women that are all sorrows. I'll say it like that out of my love for Judge Holmes. And I learned so much from this very brilliant woman, how she maneuvers. She has had experience in the House and came to the Senate. And I'm sure we're going to be in for a treat tonight with her giving us the whole run of this bill, not just the actual bill, but then how the implementation looks as well. Good evening. Thank you. And let me just say to everyone, uh, you know, we have folk that are in um, Tallahassee, um, um, that are on the ground, on the daily, uh, trying to work with uh, both these senators. Um, and they report back the good and the bad. And I'm happy to report that there was no bad to report. She uh, said exactly, it seems like they were the only senators there at one point, because a lot of the, and I'll say it, y'all not saying, it, I'm saying, it, your colleagues were not helpful in many of those, in many of those spaces. And so when they go up to Tallahassee, we send them up, we need to make sure that they are not alone. Um, they are sharing information uh, with us. And um, Senator Davis, I was at a couple of events and some folk were complaining about some other people that were not there, but they use, unfortunately for that person, they use the Senator as the example of what to do. It's almost like she didn't leave because we're getting information weekly about what's happening. And, you know, and so they were very appreciative um, and, and that they're so, now this is, something that we need because people need to know what's going on. People are interested because you all need, just like we need you there, you need us to be involved. And so we, we continue to stand ready, but all good reports um, for you. Um, let us start with, um, uh, we'll do education, uh, we'll do the voter piece last. So let's talk about some of the other bills um, that passed and certainly we think that are going to affect our community um, in a negative way. Go right ahead, either one of you want to take it. I'll start with education. Um, I served on education pre-K to 12 and being a former school board member, it was a very, very interesting session as it relates to education. So I'll start with the good. So I was delighted to co-sponsor House Bill 379, Technology in K through 12 Public Schools, which I'm losing a lot of cool points with my kids, but they'll get over it. This bill will ban the use of social media while students are in school. They will only be able to use social media for educational purposes. 
It also requires that school districts teach social media safety to include human trafficking. A lot happens on social media during school time. I believe that it is a major contributor to bullying, fights in the cafeteria, fights after school, um, activity that happens in restrooms that shouldn't be happening because kids are communicating off social media. And social media is a place where perverts and really sick people prey on our children through different apps. So I believe that this bill is gonna be very helpful. When we think about it, social media came and we just let our, let our kids loose on it. We didn't have any curriculum, any training. You know, many of us that don't mind being parents monitor the social media, but there are parents who do not have the passwords to an $800 cell phone that they, they pay for. I don't understand that, Judge Holmes. So kids go on social media and they have access to all kinds of things that they should not. Also, um, there was an education bill uh, that came about, actually an appropriation that I sponsored for Broward Schools for $250,000 to have a mentoring mental health piece for athletes. We know that we've lost several athletes during their time in Broward County Schools and even after they graduate. We have not been paying attention to the stress that the athletes are under, not just from academic achievement and playing sports, but a lot of pressure like getting the family out, making it to the NBA or NFL. And we've gotten some very, very bad results. So if the governor signs this appropriation, we'll have money to begin in Broward schools, providing a mentorship program, particularly for athletes. Next, I'll go to the Universal Voucher, Voucher Bill, HB1. That was a horrible, horrible piece of legislation. That legislation is gonna take about $4 billion away from our public school system. Because what it does is it provides vouchers to students that want to go to private schools. So here is how it works. Those students that are already in private school with their parents paying full tuition, they will now be eligible for the first round of these vouchers. Yes, you heard it community, the government is changing. Rich people are now getting government subsidies, yes. So then the next group of students will be the students that are being homeschooled. They will have access to vouchers as well. And when we hear them talk about the vouchers and that how they were targeted to poor kids, the medium income level has increased. So then the middle class parents who could probably pay half of the tuition would now get those vouchers. And then what's left could possibly be to uh, a kid of a low income family. When you talk about school choice, I wanna be very, very clear and I'm gonna be basic and I'll digress after and let uh, Senator, Davis, uh, Senator Davis add her comments. Private school is not a choice for a poor family. As a person whose children went to traditional public charter school and private school, at private schools, you have to pay tuition, you have to pay for transportation, you have to pay for lunch, and you have to pay for activity fees. Parents with low income get all of those things paid for for free in a traditional public school setting and in most charter school settings. The $8,500 plus that comes with the voucher does not cover the full tuition in the private school. So you got the other part of the tuition, you have transportation, free lunch, and activity fees. So if you're a parent making $50,000 a year, and you really wanna send your kid to a private school, those vouchers do not allow you to do that. I am a proponent of all schools that work, but I'm not a proponent of continuing to take resources from the traditional public school system so that it doesn't work. And then I'll come back after Senator Davis and talk more about the capital outlay bill, which is more egregious, Senator Davis. Thank you, Senator Rasan. I was um, trying to get prepared a little bit. I've had spent my time dealing with the election bills, 
but um, just to talk about some other things that um, probably wasn't so, you all have heard the news, you've watched what was going on. Um, we dealt with uh, the gun sales, permitless carry, um, and we felt like that was a bill that is really going to set up our young people for a false sense of um, security. Um, the argument for that was, you know, you're turning over or turning back or turning against revenue that should be coming into the state to now allow anyone that, as they say, is eligible to carry a, a gun now has the ability to carry it without a permit. And that is just a false sense of security for Black people and Brown people. And we know um, what's going to happen with that. You know, we can um, we can actually see a police officer walking up to the car of a young person asking if they have a weapon and, you know, something ensuing and the police officer perhaps saying, well, I thought I saw a gun. And, and so the, we're going to see a backlash of that. But we have a, a body that likes to say to us as the Democrats in the building, well, if it doesn't work, we always have next session to come back and fix it. So I hope we're not looking at um, a dead body count with the bill we told you was not sufficient for black and brown communities and a bill that you should not be removing um, the, the mandate of having a license to carry a weapon. So, you know, Senator Roussan, Senator Osgood talked about the good, bad and the ugly. Um, she listed a number of ugly things but again, that, that permitless carry was one that was very hard to stomach. There was some good stuff um, faintly about this session. We passed a number of healthcare things that will help our community. One of them being a sickle cell program that will help um, create a registry and help us to um, provide services and care for those people who are on Medicaid and we can find the sickle cell trait um, in their body and track them to um, pay for research to help with the cure because we all know that we do not have a cure for the sickle cell um, disease that's taking away uh, uh, people every day, especially in, and it's rampant in the black community. Um, again, we also had some things that affected our children when we're talking about gender reassignment, um, our LGBTQ community. Um, this was a session of attacks. This body that we call colleagues, they attacked women when it came to the six week ban. And if you've ever been pregnant, um, a lot of us do not know that you're pregnant at five or six weeks. So we talked about that and we talked about the negative implications that there that's going to cost them folks with finding out late that they're pregnant because now you need to have that transition or make that decision earlier but it also does even more than that it also penalizes and criminalizes the doctors who are providing either care for our children when they're doing the gender reassignment procedures or they're also penalizing and criminalizing doctors that are providing care and services for someone that's choosing to have an abortion. So this session was an attack on women. It was an attack on our children. It, it was an attack on our families. And it was just a simple all out attack on black and brown people. And so those are just some of the bills I can think of right off the top of my head. We, we did do another good thing and it was something that I carried um, we know that police officers not, are not trained in every, every aspect of the job. There's always more training that can be done. And when it comes to Baker acting and the mental health series that we're going through with our people, um, my, colleague and, my colleagues and I were able to pass a bill that helped with the operation administration of the Baker Act. It will provide... Um, uh, notification. It will provide notice on the website. It will also provide training to service providers as well as law enforcement officers as to how to handle people when they're being Baker acted and what is the circumstances in uh, uh, that's surrounding that type of situation. So we're very proud of, of passing that. 
that we know will help in the mental health situations that we know law enforcement officers as well as service providers in this realm will will have to encounter. So um, with that, Senator Osgood, I'm going to throw it back to you because I know you wanted to um, continue on and I'll pick up some more information as well. Thank you, Senator Davis. And now I'll go back to education, just um, a few more bills. So there was a bill uh, brought forth to share capital outlay dollars, House Bill 1259, meaning that traditional public schools would share capital outlay dollars with charter schools. So capital outlay dollars are the funds in school districts that you can only spend for facilities, for construction and facility maintenance. In a school district, the state requires the district to have a five-year capital outlay plan. So the bill that came forth will hit Broward County Public Schools to the tune of 58,000, dollars $58, So when the district lose that money, they have made commitments based on their five-year capital plan. They've also incurred debt and they're building out that plan, anticipating getting that money through the 1.5 mil tax that's levied on all of us to support our schools. So if they now have to share those dollars with charter schools, it's gonna be a major impact where they could possibly not be able to service their debt. If they have to take money from the general revenue fund in the school district, you have multiple pots of money that you can only spend for certain things. If your general revenue fund goes 3% below your budget, then you are in violation of the state for your financial status. So when this bill came forth, every time you hear allocations and monies for schools that talk about giving money to schools based on the number of kids, you should pause that the, the money follows the kid. Right now, the state of Florida is like 47 where they give like $8,500 plus dollars per kid. That's very low. When it comes to capital outlay dollars, if you distributed capital outlay dollars based on the number of students, it's even a greater atrocity. And here's why. Mr. Brown could have a school with 5,000 kids and he get the $8,500 for those 5,000 kids. I can have a school with 1,000 kids I get the money for those thousand kids. But my school, especially if it's on the east side, it's built at an earlier time. So the building is older. I need a new roof. I need the air conditioner upgraded because now it's 30 years old. And I have different facility needs. So Mr. Brown is sitting with capital outlay dollars that he does not need with the 5,000 students. And me having a thousand students, I don't have enough money to fix up my facilities. Capital outlay dollars have to be distributed based on facility needs. You have to do a need of a facility. Whether you have two kids in the building or 2000 does not change the need of the building that has mold, the roof falling in, et cetera. So that bill passed, it was signed into law by the governor. Hopefully we can go back next session and make some amendments. I think I have a, at least a solution that'll start us where we meet with charter schools and see how we can look at the needs of all of our schools based on the need. The second point about this is, is when we use our tax dollars to fix up traditional public school buildings, those are buildings that we own. Most charter schools are in lease to purchase agreement where the building is owned by the charter school company or by a private landlord. So now the government is taking tax dollars and making investment into people's personal real estate property. And I'll stop there and, and just let you grab that as I move on. So the major controversy that came out of education, it started with this crazy letter that I believe Mr. Manny Diaz, our commissioner of education, had a moment of temporary insanity. You know, I love the Lord. So I'm willing to give grace. And during that moment of temporary insanity, he sends out this letter that says an African-American AP study course 
has no educational value. We know that all history have educational value. It's where we get out empirical evidence of best practices and our Harvard lessons learned that we should never repeat. So then there was a bill that came out, HB 999. And I wanna take a minute to just say this because I've been on a lot of Zooms and I've been hearing a lot of erroneous information. When a bill is filed, it comes out in a certain format. As the session go on, the bill changes. Sometimes there, there's a strike all amendment that's filed that changes the whole bill. There are other amendments made to add stuff to the bill to take the bill out. Then the House and the Senate have to come together and match language in the bill that we both can agree on. So HB 99 was extremely horrific. We didn't go with that version. We went with Senate Bill 266. And that bill's language was a lot better. So I'm going to start off by being very clear. That bill 266 does not eliminate the teaching of African American history in college on college campuses. What it does is it says that you cannot teach systemic racism, oppression, and sexism in core courses. Now, in talking to three or four college presidents at HBCUs, they don't do that anyway. That bill would not eliminate Black Greek fraternities and sororities. State dollars do not fund Black Greek life. Black Greek life is self-funded. And just for the record, all the divine nines have money. We have grad chapters. We have chapters literally all over the world. If we had to fund a chapter on a college campus, we could do that. I'm proud to say that Alpha Kappa Alpha launched this year the first Black-owned female credit union for members only. So I don't want kids that are in Greek life on college campuses to be overwhelmed and stressed out thinking that those opportunities are going to go away because that's just not the truth. We won't allow Governor DeSantis or nobody to take that away from our children. When you talk about this bill, and it deals more with diversity, equity, and inclusion. What we need to be paying attention to is when you remove that from a school campus, then you can't set formulas and give points to contractors that are having minority primes, minority subcontractors. So it begins to make it very hard to show that Black companies get business. This, is, this played out in the recent Broward School uh, school board meeting, and I was very surprised that Dr. Holness was the only one that was speaking up about these dollars that supposed to be minority dollars that are now being taken away. That bill also puts a focus on the way that schools are rated. It talks about premier schools. That's about five schools in Florida who have over 40,000 students. It doesn't impact our HBCUs. So simultaneously, there was another bill that came out where it was a bipartisan bill sponsored by Representative, uh, Representative Benjamin, Christopher Benjamin from Miami, and Senator Corey Simon, a Democrat and a Republican, both yes brothers of color, HB 551. And what this bill does is it makes school districts accountable for teaching African-American history. Since 1996 and 1997, there's been a law in the books for school districts to teach African-American history, and many of them have not been doing it. So this bill will make them have to report it every year, how they're teaching it and what they're teaching. And the African-American history courses have to start before slavery, which gives the full gamut of African-American history, or how Black people were kings and rulers, how we invented geometry and trigonometry and math before they was ever, ever even coined the word. So I want us to just be clear about that because I constantly hear misinformation. The bill changed as it went through the process. So we're no longer talking about eliminating black history. And finally on education, when you hear somebody say critical race theory, don't just automatically equate race to black people. Critical race theory includes systemic racism, but it also includes black intellectual inferiority. There was this nutcake professor at Harvard 
that says that genetically black people are intellectually inferior. So when you have the whole notion of critical race theory, it teaches these different perspectives about different races. And if you're in law school, a master's program or doctorate program, you need to have those kinds of discussions. So I don't know why it was just a focus on systemic racism and not a focus on this black intellectual inferiority stuff that they're teaching. I did offer an amendment, it was not accepted. But we have to make sure that we have the right information and that we're using the right words. And Senator Davis and I are talking to you as policymakers. One of the struggles that we have is we have people that tweet stuff, that post stuff without looking at the actual bill of communicating the truth about what happens and it becomes weaponized and it becomes political, politicized. And then we're fighting about something that's not even in the bill. And the people on the other side say stuff like this. Oh, if they would just read. Now we know that's racist, right? But if you sharing and test, testifying in a committee meeting and you got the wrong information because you have not read the bill, then you make me have to pray real hard when they start saying if they would just read because I, you know, I want to say some stuff, but I have to represent y'all and represent the Lord well, so I can't do it. So I'm going to stop there for education, Madam President, and take your direction as to how we should proceed. Okay, I am going to, uh, um, if you have a question, please put it in uh, Q&A. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, brought on one of our, my counterpart from Indian River County, um, Mr. Anthony Brown. He's a president of the Indian River County branch NACP. He's also the third vice president for the Florida State Conference. Um, on this line, we have, y'all know it's AKA Thick on here, but there are also um, several of the Alpha Phi Alpha um, Fraternity Incorporated, Delta Sigma Theta. I've seen Faith in Florida. I've seen uh, um, members from the South Brevard branch of the NAACP. I see the Black Firefighters. I see a FAMU um, alumni chapter, Broward County. Um, I see Golden Victor, uh, number 44, Order of Eastern Stars. Um, and of course, I mentioned earlier, um, President Pierre, who is out of Miami, and I see y'all know Vanessa Byers, Byers, who is also out of Miami. So we're having a, a good group of folk um, who are, we are going to start to talk about how uh, Senate Bill 7050 is going to affect all of us uh, um, who are registering, uh, who continue to register voters as well. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the banning books. And I saw um, the press conference, I saw Tory on there and he was like, oh, oh, governor, we're just so, we're just so glad you did this. And um, it's a hoax and we all know that's a lie. So um, when we, what's really happening when it comes to the banning of the books? Um, I saw in Miami-Dade, um, President Pierre, where um, it was a poem just the other day, yesterday, that was banned, uh, that, that school was said. So the process of which is being, the books are being considered, is it true? So one, one parent could say they feel some sort of way, and then what's the process past that? Senator Davis. I'll start it, and because Senator Osgood is our school board member, and we love having her in the Senate to give us all of that direction. Um, I don't know if you all know, and I, I saw that article too, Amanda Gorman's um, poem was just banned. And so I don't know if you all know about the Jacksonville situation that literally the governor called out in one of his press conferences about books being banned and, and it was a hoax. And that's where he was coming from. That happened in Jacksonville. But the issue is there was no clarity and don't you all think, don't you think for a minute that when he says it's a hoax, that that's the truth, we all know that books are being taken off the shelf. That is the truth because there was no clarity and understanding for the districts to understand what was to remain on the shelves and what was not to remain on the shelves. The issue is a parent, one parent, or someone that doesn't even have a child in the school system can request submit a book to be reviewed. 
So therefore in Jacksonville, what they were doing is because it was unclear, they were covering the books, removing them from the shelves and covering them to ensure until they receive clarity as to what the rulemaking authority would be for the districts to remove books and how they would go about it, they didn't have that clarity or the knowledge. So it wasn't a hoax, it was the truth. Books are being removed. And just like we saw the other day, Amanda Gordon's poem that she read before this entire country is now subject to be banned. So there is no hoax about it. We have a governor that is banning books. And I think I saw something in the comment was like, we would love to read, but the comment said, but our books are being banned. <laughs> and they're absolutely right. So there is no hoax about it. That's what this governor is doing. And so to for, for me, the frustration is we, we were talking about in session and we were running one particular amendment. If a parent is upset about a book and they want it to be banned, how about we take that book and we don't allow that child's, that parent's child to read that book? But you are talking about a parent or someone outside of the school system that can put this request forward and ban a book for the entire school. So it, it's there. It's happening. And it's the truth. Senator Osgood, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so I am doing, y'all yeah, know I'm a researcher and a reader. So right now I'm trying to get in my possession what they're calling the book ban list that they say that they're working on. Because in my conversations with Mr. Diaz and other people in the Department of Education, they're saying that the books have not been reviewed in a number of years, so now they're reviewing them. And they are reacting to some books that was in a school library that had some pornographic uh, pictures or something in the book. Um, and we know we can all define pornographic differently, so I didn't see the book. When I inquired specifically about Maya Angelou, I know why the cave bird sings, Toni Morrison, The Bluest Eyes, they said to me that those books have not been banned. They have just been moved to the high school curriculum. Now, if you're familiar with either of those books, I do agree they're not books for elementary school. But as Senator Davis said, when these policies come forward, the governor makes his little bully comments because of what people putting on Twitter. Then if you're working in a school district, you don't know what to do. And because everything is being criminalized now, you could lose your job, you could be sued, the board can be sued. People react and they want to protect themselves. They react because they don't want to get sued. They don't want to end up being arrested. Now, I, I'm glad to say I was at Nova High School in Broward County on uh, Wednesday night with my sorority for Let's Taco About It, a mental health awareness program that we was doing. And I was proud to walk into the cafeteria to see two full boards there that says Black history. And it, it was all across the cafeteria. Now, when you look at the principal of Nova, she's one of your sororities, Judge Holmes. And I wanted to say that because it's important that we have representation in our school systems and leadership that people of color are there and that when these kind of things come forward that we do the due diligence and we get the correct information that we don't let people just off the hook because they use that as an excuse not to bring forth a book or not to teach something. We are in our communities now looking for the books that they are banned. Uh, we've collected books. We're gonna be giving books to our kids. We should have been pushing literacy and reading with our kids. Nobody's gonna stop our kids from learning about their history and using books to learn about their history. I suggest that if you're listening, reach out to the Department of Education. We need people of color to volunteer to serve on some of these book banning committees and all this other stuff that's going on with education. We can't allow people that's been there for 10 and 12 years that just go along to get along so that we have the truth, we have somebody on the inside with information. I will give you, Madam President, an update as soon as I can, because this is one of the things that I've taken on for my summer project,
because I want to see these books. I want to have discussion about what people are saying and what they're doing. And then they'll say, we're not the books that we're banning have pornographic information, have pornographic material. We can't have kids looking at those books. Well, I agree with that. But what we're getting is from teachers is that they are afraid. They don't know what they can say and what they cannot say. And that's part of the reason why we have a 5,780 uh, teacher shortage in the state of Florida. Teachers are leaving. They're tired of the, the union busting bill that came forth, where now, you know, they have to have 60% of their members. They can't get it deducted from their check. And even more egregious, if you have a union, now you have to pay for a full audit. Audits start about twelve to $15,000. Small unions don't have the money to pay for an audit from a CPA firm. They don't handle enough money to even have to do that. So the book thing is something that we need to pay attention to, but we need to email the Department of Education and ask for the book ban list. We need to let them know that we're watching and we will continue to watch and we need to ask follow-up questions about these books so we can help empower our teachers that they can feel comfortable. If you are a teacher and you think that, you know, you're going to get sued or something happens or you get some type of retaliation, re become a member first, make sure you're a member, but reach out to your NAACP. That's why I love the NAACP because when we need to go to court, they are there prepared to have our backs and some things we're going to have to fight in court. Thank you. I have a quick question from um, Roosevelt Walters. He says, if a book, um, if a book is banned at Dilla High School, will it be on the shelf at um, or used at Ely High School or is it just school by school or how does that work? No, it's overall when it, when a parent files a formal complaint, the book goes into review. The concern that we have, as Senator Davis said, we don't know how long that review process is. We don't know who makes the decision exactly whether it's just a parent or it's a book that, you know, really needs to be banned. But if it is banned, then it is banned from not only Dilla, it's a ban across Broward County and across the state of Florida. So the review process is what we're trying to better understand as to who determines that a book is not appropriate. You know, a lot of people that work in the Department of Education, they don't even have a background in education. Some of them are appointed by the governor. That's true. Uh, Senator Davis, so Senate Bill 7050 in its final form, I know it changed a bit. I also know that the moment it, the bill was signed, the NAACP filed in federal court. Uh, Judge Holmes, we have, drawn, we have drawn Judge Walker um, and then uh, League of Women Voters um, and I believe LDF also filed and they have drawn Judge Hinkle. Um, we went solo this time because we uh, we this is so important that we needed some dogs in court. We needed to fight with everything. And so we have decided to go with the Alliance Partner Group this time. But we uh, and chances are they'll all be combined as they have been in the past. Um, but we 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 were, you know, a lot of people say, well, why are you all waiting so late to file? Why haven't you done it before? Because you can't file in federal court, it didn't even go into effect until he signed it. He had to sign it first before we could actually file. So a lot of people thought that we were slow on the draw, but remember that it had in there was the, you didn't, what is it, the changing of the, uh, you didn't have to file, you didn't have to resign to run. And so they needed to time that when he filed to run uh, for uh, for president and then go into that, those different pieces. So everything was just strategy, it's just not just happening. But let's talk about uh, SB 70, and particularly, I think the most some of the most controversial changes are the targets uh, uh, for the third party voter registration, um, which is basically everyone that's on this call. Uh, Senator Davis, you're muted. Thank you. Am I back? Thank yes. you for that. Um, yeah. The third party voter registration groups are the groups that's going to hit hardest and through a lot of the conversations, unfortunately, um, this governor signed this bill today, 
And it remains that in 2020, this is the same governor that said Florida was the gold standard of elections. And here we are again, year after year, um, making massive changes to election law over the last three years. So I'll do the best. It's a lot. This bill had a lot of little technical things. And, um, you know, when you're dealing with elections and you have someone look at something and they say, oh, it's not that bad. Um, my stance becomes anytime we're changing something with the, within the election rules and the election law, it is bad because it's always going to affect the black and brown communities more than it's going to affect anyone else. And so in the midst of having conversations with this, the third party organizations took the hit. I mean, it's a lot of little technical things when it comes to the vote by mail um, ballots and the systems and the lessening of the days and things like that. But you are talking about third party voter registration groups getting hit with a $250,000 fine. It's increased from 50 to 100,000 to now 250,000. And I know there's a lot of groups on this call so I'm going to be as blunt as possible with all of you. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Through all of the conversations, you all are getting that $250,000 hit per calendar year for three organizations. Voting, voter participation, Hard Knocks, and First Coast Leadership Foundation. So you, you have people that don't necessarily care about you, vote, you registering to vote pe for people. Um, they don't care that you're the heartbeat when it comes to voters being registered. What they cared about and what they saw are the repeated late voter registrations coming in. I think it was a total of maybe 160. Someone could probably know the ac actual number, but they took that and used it against you. And so that's why we're here dealing with those type of fines. We're also dealing with fines that are now gone from a fine of $50 per day when it comes to application being delivered to upward, upwards to $2,500. And fines that were $100 are now in the range of $5,000 um, when something goes happens after the close of the, the book deadline. So you know, you're suffering because of that. You, you all do know now that we have the election Office of Election Crimes and, and Security, that office is getting prepared to start knocking on doors as we speak. That office is getting ready because the, the idea and the plan, let's start putting this office out in the field and these people out in the field to create that intimidation when folks are trying to do voter registration. Our colleagues, our counterparts start planning years out. So, um, Marsha, it's not you all being slow to the draw. It's the rest of us understanding what that strategy is. And they have a strategy and they've always had it. So along with the fines, you now have made um, things go up to third degree felonies when it comes to our voter registration groups. Um, when you're copying applications, trying to retain personal a person's personal information. I know what you're doing that for. You know what you're doing that for but now it's become a felony to do it. And the only thing you're doing is trying to, to collect the information so you know for your records who you've registered or not. So it's prohibiting um, third party groups from mailing or providing pre-field voter registration applications. That's now a fine of $50. And it's also requiring the third party organizations to affirm that each person that's collecting or handling a voter registration is a US citizen. So that now that becomes a fine of $50,000. We tried to get um, the answers to a lot of these questions as to why, why is that important? Why you know, does it matter if the person is a US citizen? And because the person, the sponsor wasn't as skilled as he needed to be, of course he never answered any of those questions. So. It's a lot going on, um, and you all are taking the brunt of this. Um, Marsha, I don't know if you want me to go outside of the third party because you I do. started with the third party. Okay, well, we'll continue. <laughs> um, it's also, like we said, we go up to 250000 with the fines. 
Um, it's re it's reduced. This bill has reduced the number of days that a person can be request and have a ballot mailed to them. So the new deadline is by 5 p.m. 12 days out instead of 5 p.m. 10 days out. So again, when someone is requesting a vote by mail ballot, they can't get to, um, uh, they have to do it during the early voting session, early voting period of time or election day. And that that is not happening for them. Now they have to complete an emergency affidavit which is completely unnecessary. And we all know that's an unnecessary and, and burdensome thing for folks to do. Um, we are now mandating that when a supervisor of election receives a vote by mail envelope, if there are more than two ballots, in two or more ballots in that envelope, they are going to reject both envelopes, I mean, both ballots. So for instance, a lot of us have elderly people and a number of our counties don't pay for postage. My county does. Elderly people will, will husband and wife sometimes will stick two ballots in one vote by mail envelope and send it back thinking they're saving money. Well, at this point, both of those ballots will be rejected. That's what this bill just did. Um, along with the supervisors of elections, they have to now uh, put notices. They don't have, put, have to put notices in the papers. They can put notices on the website. Um, and again, this bill is simply creating a large amount of expense. Um, the supervisors do not have money because they, they're prohibited from gaining getting money from outside sources. We did that in SB 90 and SB 524, the last two election bills. So when it comes to an education campaign with the changing of all these rules and mandates that they're putting on the, the books, they have no money to, to do that. A um, lot of stuff going on in this, this bill. There are a few things that are okay. I'll never say that an election bill is decent. There are decent things like um, it mandates for public tax supported buildings to now be available to use for early voting locations. That was being done for polling locations, but it was not being done for early voting locations. So that's one decent thing about this bill. It also clarifies who the immediate family member is, um, ensuring that family members of the voters as well as their spouse is identified. That's decent when they're returning the vote by mail ballot. And so the other decent thing about this bill is SB 524. Um, this bill helps remove language requiring address confirmation notice letters to go to residential addresses. That's problematic when a number of people have mailing addresses on the file. So this bill does that. It clarifies that it can go back to um, those address confirmation letters being sent to uh, mailing addresses. So, and that becomes problematic for our seniors, our students, and people living in rural areas. The other thing is we deal with a lot of signatures. When you're dealing with vote by mail, you people have to sign verifying that that ballot inside is their ballot. So anyone dealing with verification of signatures, they now are mandated to take a signature training course. And the last thing is it allows for um, the VBM request to be made by, by way of the supervisor of elections websites. So those are the decent things about this bill. Um, you, you now have, and I, my, my colleague, Senator Osgood, took this and owned it because it was so much more technical stuff in this bill. She, with a voter information card, this is where they're going to trip us up. And this is where the Office of Election Crimes and Security will knock on folks' door. When someone is given a, a voter registration application, they fill it out, they sign it, and they give it to the supervisor of elections or by way of a grassroots organization then you receive a voter information card. That is an indication that you have been approved and your eligibility has been verified. The biggest thing about this bill is that is the procedure. But now it says when a person receives a voter registration card, 
it's for informational purposes only. And the card is proof of registration, but not proof of legal verification of eligibility to vote. When you are given your driver's license, you are given permission or the authority to drive. So when someone is given a voter information card, they are thinking they are being given the authority and the approval to vote. We identified in 97, statute 97.073 for our colleagues that that is what that said. And that's in that law that I just quoted, it said a voter information card sent to an applicant constitutes notice of approval of registration. And you all still know that they didn't hear anything we said, but it's identified in statute that when a person receives a voter information card, that is giving them approval to go and vote. That will be the biggest thing we see when we have an election that people receive this card, understand in their mind that they think they're eligible and they're not. It is now the onus of the person receiving the card. It is now their job to verify whether they're eligible to vote or not. The sponsor said, well, the, well the, the Secretary of State is waiting on people to utilize his services. All they have to do is call, call the office and ask for an opinion, an advisory opinion. And we all know on this call that when you're already in an intimidation type situation, picking up the phone to call the Division of Election to ask them for an advisory opinion, it's probably not something one of our returning citizens is going to do. So we got to work through that. We have to make sure these people are not intimidated by that measure. And lo and behold, any one of those advisory opinions are going to take three or four months to get, get cleared, whether they have an answer or not. The bill also um, clarifies some issues where it had some intent to penalize a person when it talked about willfully casting a ballot. Those are the type of issues that we're going to have to deal with because that's the technicality of, of this bill that they went into. It does clarify the prosecution for voting for voting on more than one ballot, but we're going to have to be mindful and we're going to have to hold some hands with these this new law that's being put on the books. It's, it's really technical. It's unfortunate. Um, it, it deals with some things with the SOE sending notices of ineligibility and the voter responding to that within a 30 day period. Um, and it also strikes the requirement of the supervisor must use all addresses on the file, voter file, if an address confirmation request is returned undeliver undeliverable without any indication of an address change. And that that's problematic. It goes into some, some more technical stuff. That's kind of the top surface. The more technical things deals with the canvassing boards, precinct boundaries, um, voter guide, and how the voter guide has to have a disclaimer um, from the organization that's issuing it, as well as some more technical stuff with the Department of, of Motor, Vote, Motor Highway um, Safety and Motor Vehicle and some other additional report changes. So. There was a piece in here that we kind of harped on, and this is the last thing I'll say about this bill. When now you had the division of elections sending down to the counties the information of returning citizens and people that may have committed a crime or something in one county versus the other, there's a piece in this bill that mandates a, pro a process that the clerk of court will be sending information to the division, the clerk of court will be sending information to the SOE, um, instead of the division of elections sending that information down to the supervisors. The reason I bring this up is because it's problematic. It's problematic in the terms that a clerk of the court in Duval County doesn't have the information that a clerk of a court in Broward County does. They're not connected in that way. The connection is division of elections. So now we've removed the job of the division of elections and allowed the clerk of courts to disseminate um, needed information when it comes to our returning citizens and someone that's committed a crime or felony and it affects their voting registration rights to now the counties instead of the division of election continuing to do its job 
and funnel the most accurate information down to each um, supervisor of elections. That is going to be problematic. And it's also a process that I heard from supervisor versus supervisor after supervisor that that's not a process that they can readily do. It's a process that has to be created. And so without Eric, um, and you all know you're in, in this system without Eric, and that was a system that the supervisors used to be able to know what was happening in all the counties around them. That was a system that housed all that information and helped the supervisors when, when cleaning up their records. We're not, we don't have that anymore because the Division of Elections Secretary, um, whatever the man name is, said that it, it wasn't a political move. It's just other avenues we can use, Secretary Byrd. So just want you to know, we are walking into an election system that we're going to have to be on the top on top of because we do have a number of technical things with this last bill that's going to cause us some delay, that's going to cause us some fright um, because of this Office of Elections and, and Security Crimes. They're, they're waiting to pounce. You just need to know that. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, Senator Osgood, I think it was something in there that I read that talked, that spoke to being able to have to be a citizen to register and also it addressed certain um, uh, felony uh, convictions, perhaps. So, what is what do you know about that? And then, do you know what they're what they claim they're thinking the 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 reasoning for putting that in? Okay, so I had some direct discussions because I'm kind of wired that way. I'm gonna go to the bill sponsor. I'm gonna ask direct questions, especially when I think black people are being targeted. So I was told that there was an organization that went into the villages and registered about 669 people to vote. I don't know if Senator Davis was in that committee meeting and they never turned in those individuals voting uh, information. They registered them, they never turned the information in, but what they did is they hacked the people and stole like money from their bank account, et cetera. And when they looked into the organization, several of the persons working in this organization were convicted felons. And it was not necessarily a minority organization, I'll say that. So that created this whole reaction of criminalizing people for not turning in uh, voter registration uh, information, for copying people's information. When you look at the bill, it's like a second degree felony if you copy somebody's voter's registration. So normally in public policy, there is a need or a problem that you're trying to fix. So I haven't been able to find any data. We asked a lot of questions of an overwhelming number of people saying that they was having problems registering the vote. This is something again, that's made up and then used to weaponize it. I want to be very clear about a couple of things that Senator Davis kind of touched on. When you register to vote and you get that card and you see that disclaimer that says, this is to confirm that you've registered, but it does not determine your eligibility. Make sure you pay attention to that. Now, who does that? When you get approved for a credit card, they send it to you and you call and get it activated. They could have done that, but they chose not to. It is your individual responsibility to determine whether you are eligible to vote or not. If you are a returning citizen and you get that card and you go vote, they're gonna come back and arrest you if you are not eligible to vote. When you call into the Department of Election, my fear is they're gonna do just like they did our people with their unemployment checks, take the phone off the hook. So every time you call, the, it, the line is busy until after the election to keep you from voting. That's just my own personal Rosalind Osgood conspiracy theory based on what I've seen happen before. Another point that I wanna make because a lot of organizations that do this work on the ground help our returning citizens and give them jobs so that they can make money to take care of their family. This bill specifically makes a pro get prohibition against persons with certain felony convictions handling complete voters registration applications. So if you have any felonies and you're working a job where you're getting people to complete voter registration, or you're just volunteering, many people get their lives together, they volunteer in the community, 
If you have a felony, you better make sure that your felony is not in what they call a certain felony. They don't define these things because if so, you're not able to even handle a voter's registration card. They talk about felonies that involve fraud, identity theft, exploitation of vulnerable adults, but the language is still loose. So we have to make sure that we're not allowing our people to be criminalized. Another thing that I find the language to be very loose, and this is for people that run for political office. So this bill creates a new requirement for voters guides. And it defines vote, a voter guide as mail that is either in electioneering communication or political advertisement for the purpose of advocating for or endorsing particular issues or candidates by recommending specific electoral choices to the voter and by indicating an issue or candidate selection on an unofficial ballot. The bill specifies a required disclaimer for the voter's guide and it prohibits a person from representing that a voter's guide is the official publication of a political party unless such person is given specific written permission. Now, it don't say who you get the written permission from or what the written permission has to say. So even now with voters guides, and we know our community get flooded with those voters guides, who if you making those voters guides, you better be careful that you know the change in this law and that you're not doing something now that you can come back and be arrested for, for violating this law. And while we're on this, I see we have quite a number of people on the Zoom. If you could just, if you in Broward or Miami, if you in Broward, please take out your cell phone and go to BrowardVotes.org and pull up vote by mail ballot and go ahead and request your vote by mail ballot now. If you in Miami, you can go to their supervisor of elections website and request that vote by mail ballot. If you in Palm Beach, it's vote Palm Beach. We need to get ahead of this. We were all kicked off the vote by mail roll in January. Yes. You got to re-request it now, and then you got to re-request it every two years. So let's go ahead and get that out of the way now. It's going to ask you for your driver's license number or the last four digits of your social security number. You have to do it. Don't think about getting hacked because if you use Cash App, Zelle, your information is already out there. You really don't have no privacy. They hide banks or whatever. And, you know, I don't think you got a couple of million that you worried about being stolen. If you do, give me a call because I need some scholarship money. But we need to go ahead and request those vote by mail ballots now so that we're in the system. And once you do it, you can go on and check your status and it'll tell you that your vote by mail ballot has been requested. Because as Senator Davis said, they took away two days off of requesting a vote by mail ballot. And they were trying in the original bill to even mess with souls to the polls. But when stuff started being said about it, they left it at the discretion of the supervisor of election, whether they have um, that day of early voting, the Sunday before voting, or whether they stop it on Friday. I want to add that this bill, and I'm saying this for legal reasons in AACP, this bill had no House counterpart. It didn't go through a lot of committees. It was just pushed at the last minute. It did not follow the formal process that bills normally follow. So I just want to throw that in the mix while we are talking about it. But we have to stay on top of this, but we can't be afraid. And at the end of the day, y'all, people done died. Other people done went to jail for our right to vote. So, you know, if you ain't got no records, you get locked up, you can call Judge Holmes. She knows some people she'll get you out. But we got to make sure that everybody registered to vote and that they cast in their vote. We can't let this bike us away and shut us down. This is a direct attack to try to make us scared and prevent us from voting. And y'all know how we handle that in the hood. When somebody draw the line in the sand, what do we do? We go get our mama, our auntie, our uncle, our cousins, even those cousins that ain't real cousins, and we fight. So this is the time that we rally as a community and we fight and make sure that we're requesting our vote by mail ballots and that we're registering people to vote within the law. The NAACP is a third party voters registration organization. Reach out to them. If you're an organization that was registering people to vote and you don't have the structure, 
reach out to the NAACP, reach out to Faith and Florida, other groups. We are working with these groups and we can come with those entities and help you register people in a legal way that you don't have to worry about being arrested. Thank you. Um, and uh, our state committee woman, I know the first part was answered. Um, on the disclaimer for the voting guides, is it different for a partisan organization versus nonpartisan organization? Okay, so what the language says about the voters guide, is it speaking more directly to people or candidates that are saying they're representing a certain political party? So nonpartisan organizations don't do that anyway. So it's saying if you are saying that it's the, you know, like you see those voters guide that have Barack Obama and Kamala and say that they endorsing these people, the Democratic Party voter guide or oh, quick, the black quick. community voters guide that's not even made by black people, those kinds of things. Yeah, I did hear they call it quick picks in, uh, in Duval. Duval quick in picks. <laughs> Um, and the question I think Mr. Walters had was, as this bill goes, or these bills go, what it, what defines, what's the true definition of a third party? Um, I'll jump in and take that one. A, a true definition of a third party uh, registration group is a group that wants to do voter registration and they simply register with the state of Florida. So it could be a church organization, it could be a non party organization as far as the NAACP, it could be whatever the, the group is, it could be a person, an individual that is signed up and registered through the state of Florida to conduct voter registration. I think it's almost we're going to have to have a background check on our members who are going to be handling our voter registrations, uh, quite frankly. That's exactly what's going to happen. And that's the frustration that I know a number of the grassroots um, voter registration organizations are going to do. And here you are. That's exactly what's going to happen, because now you have to do a background check for the people that are collecting and handling voter registrations voter registration applications, but that's also causing the third party organization to go in a, into an expense that was not there before. Because now you have to provide those background checks and you got to pay for them, but that's exactly what's going to happen. And I have to say, I inadvertently left off and my, uh, my little DeBose is having a pit. Let me just say this. Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated is on the line. Okay, so the cappers are here. Uh, he sent me this little salty little text, like, really? You know, um, so we wanted to do that. Um, and so we have, uh, I believe, Mr. Senator Osgood, would you repeat the problems that uh, producers of voter guides have to watch out for? That's from our life member, Patty Lynn. Sure. So if you're doing a voter's guide and you're saying that it represents a certain political party, you have to have written consent. The bill does not say from who. Is it the state party chair, the national party chair, the president, President Joe Biden himself, the vice president? You know, it doesn't say who you have to have written permission from to pre present a voter's guide around the issue or a candidate saying that you are rep that it represents a certain political party. So the language is loose. It doesn't define who the consent must come from. So, and I'll add to that, Marsha, really quickly. The, the issue is, and you all are familiar with what we do here in Duval County. And so what, what is done in Duval County, um, unbeknownst to a lot of, lot of us, because we, we ne don't necessarily like it, it's, it becomes election illegal electioneering when it's not identified who this is coming from, but the issue is who is paying for it. Because when you start getting into the voter guides and you're providing something to a voter that's not identified how you are paying for this, you're now going into an illegal campaign finance situation. So you're in a real technical field, but when you are passing out things that are not identified by who it is, where it's being paid for, like Senator Osgood said, that is illegal election uh, electioneering communications. Um, our former uh, Broward uh, State Committee manager said he's happy to hear that voter guides will be monitored, that this has been a big problem for years, deceiving voters. 
um, in particular. It's it's definitely a thing here in uh, Broward, uh, seriously. Um, I wanted to, uh, so the, the, the returning citizen piece is really, really tricky. So I would uh, suggest that one, um, uh, we, we will still do everything we can uh, from NAACP. We have some partnerships that we can check um, prior to your voting or um, to you registering to vote. Um, and so we generally ask folk to uh, contact our office. Um, Judge Holmes will work with some other lawyers um, to, uh, to do a, an evaluation of whatever is going on and then ask some questions uh, because you don't have to, you have to have paid all your fines, fees in every state, not just Florida. You know, uh, it's not easy to get. And the idea of, and I know you all, that you all call the official name, I'm calling it the election police. Um, I believe they got a bunch of funding, senators this time, uh, uh, millions and millions, millions. Mm -hmm. of, of dollars so that they can, and I would imagine, um, I'm told that they have been in Broward since the ink dried um, last year. And so I, I would imagine um, since Broward is always under the microscope that they are here or will continue to be here as well. So I understand that people are certainly frightened. Um, so I would suggest uh, that you not uh, register or if you're concerned in enough, start at enough time so we can um, at least kind of check um, with our other group of lawyers to do a little background to see if it's, um, if they would recommend that you um, vote. Because a lot of the idea is for returning citizens to not vote. Um, and so you can't really blame them when you saw the 20 arrests um, mm -hmm. that happened. And I think most of the charges were dropped. And I think in the villages, they, I think they cried. Um, and then they let them, they basically, what did they do? Like a, almost no punishment. And they admittedly admitted had done wrong when it came to that. But I guess it all depends on um, what community um, you're mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, there was also a piece in about um, maintenance, the list, we call it purging. Um, can you all uh, tell us what that is? I know it increased the time frame when they had to um, bump people from the voting list. Not enough I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll jump in. It, it, I think it, and I can't remember that one. Just well, uh, Senator Osgood maybe remembers more. the The list maintenance is just like with what we say outside. It's the purging. It's a cleaning up of the voter registration roles that the supervisors are actually mandated by law to do, and they do it. I think it's even it's done in the odd years of just kind of cleaning up the the voter registration roles. And what, what we've done is basically made it easier or mandated that supervisors have to do that. And by doing that, they're removing people faster, quicker, because now the list maintenance has to happen in a quicker period of time. And I think that's what you're talking about, Marsha. And let mm -hmm. me just add this point and I'm, and I'm going to read it because I think, you know, they play word games. So it says, requires annual list maintenance program to begin by April 1st, provided that if a supervisor, pay attention, does not conduct required list maintenance activities, the department must coordinate with the supervisor instead of taking over. Um, it deletes the requirements that voters be sent address confirmation requests to the, their legal residents and that the confirmation must be responded to by 30 days. It mandates the supervisor conducts annual reviews of voters' registration records to identify a voter that may be registered at an address that is not his or her legal residence. So how does the supervisor of election know what your legal address is? You could literally own two or three pieces of property and people just send you mail at the other property if they're interested in buying it, et cetera. We know that Florida is a very transient state. People move around from neighborhood, neighborhood to community. So your address can change as the year go on. So if the supervisor of election sends something to one address, you know, you have another address. How do they define what your legal address is? Is it the address on your driver's license? You know, these are all the kinds of technical things that Senator Davis was talking about that's not required 
that creates a whole bunch of work and sets the supervisor of election up for them to take over their departments. This is where I see this going. You know, this is an easy way, all this reporting, the clerk of court got to contact the supervisor every week for the convicted felons. The supervisor of election has to do this, has to do that, but they're not increasing the funding for the manpower that's need to do these kinds of things. It authorized the supervisor to receive driver's license information for the purpose of verifying voter information. And it creates a deadline for determination of eligibility and removal of voters from the voting books. So if the supervisor can't find something that they need about you, they got to just remove you from the list. And these are the technical things that this bill is putting in place that makes it almost impossible to implement with fidelity because there's just too many technical things that are not fully explained. So, you know, what was happening prior to this is if, say, for instance, you didn't vote or some of, the, some of those things happened, they sent you a letter or you didn't answer for whatever reason, you will be moved from the active voting rolls to the inactive, um, which means you would, you know, if you call up or you went to vote, you could update and still vote. But if they're removing them, they're moving them to the ineligible list, which means they wouldn't be, have to, wouldn't be able to vote on election day. And so that's a whole different kind of thing. And I believe, uh, I think Grace Carrington is still on our state committee person. I was at a meeting last Tuesday that said um, um, some 300,000 uh, Broward voters had already been removed uh, from the voting rolls. Um, and that's staggering and it's still more to come, I'm sure. So we have to now uh, do what we uh, must, you know, do everything we can to get those folk back on the, the voting rolls. And I, I think I heard one of you say their the notice is no longer required. So, when maintenance off. So, so what I'm looking at is some of that language. Remember, I, I started off by telling you all the good stuff or the decent stuff that was in this bill. That language was removed and that, that language was in SB 524. You remember, this is our third bad election bill. So we had SB 90, SB 524, and now we have the 7050. That language of requiring um, the SOEs to mail that address confirmation letter um, to the voters' residents, that language was removed because just like Senator Osgood said, there's no way other than the, to the voter putting that address on the file as to where, you know, this voter really lives and want their mail to go. So that was one of the decent things. It, that language was removed. And so you, you have supervisors now being able to mail to whatever mailing address is on file because they don't, they don't necessarily know the residential address. Thank you. Uh, before we close, I wanna get a, a couple of comments um, from um, my counterparts. We will start with Madam President Pierre, Miami-Dade. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, job well done and thank you for this debrief. Um, very important information um, shared on this webinar on tonight. And I would agree, we definitely have to be vigilant and stand united to be able to register voters all across the state. We, are, we know what we're up and facing, so it's all important for us to stand together, stand with the NAACP. If you are in Broward, we encourage you to join the Broward for a lot of the branch. If you are in Miami-Dade, we encourage you to join the Miami-Dade branch. But most importantly, we encourage you to update your voter registration. As mentioned on this webinar earlier, the names of the supervisor of election websites were provided. Um, please, please tell a friend, tell a friend, and tell another friend to make certain that they are so serious about the safeguard and protection of their right to vote. It is upon us all to make certain that we do our part and we rally everyone throughout this state to the poll. So we stand with you, NAACP, Broward, Fort Lauderdale. We stand with you to our senators that are on the call. Thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom and your guidance. 
count on us as the NAACP is to make certain that we protect and defend the right to vote. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, President Anthony Brown, president of the Indian River County branch and also third vice president for the NAACP Florida State Conference. Mr. President. Yes, awesome, Madam President and uh, Senator Davis and Senator Osgood, uh, super fighters, super soldiers. You know, the visit we did up there with the Legislative Caucus, our people need to know what you ladies and others are up there really doing. Uh, some of us don't have a clue that without you and 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 Senator Davis, I echo Dr. Osgood with her background in education. They can't handle her. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's they hate to see her coming, and I know it because she's foundationally secure in what she has to say, and it rolls off her tongue like you know it was built into her. And, and a bigger thing is what you've done, Madam President, is pulling all of us together here tonight. Uh, collectively, we can be powerful. We are powerful. We need to get out of our own ways and all of this divisiveness. It, it's throw it in the trash because these people are playing chess and we playing Jack Stones. So thank you and, and let's do this work. We're all in need of steadfast and immovable and, and show this idiot, the Satan, that he can't beat us that easy. Thank you for all the work you do and let's continue to move forward. Okay, thank you. Senator Davis. I, as, 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 as closing remarks, as usual, I am always uh, grateful and honored to be a part of um, the Broward NAACP meetings. Um, Senator Osgood said it earlier, um, we're, we're in a fight. And you know what? We've we've been here before. And this is not a fight we asked for, but this is a fight we will win because we just, again, cannot allow people to be fearful. We know what we have to do. We, we know registration, voter registration is the key for all of our groups, engaging and educating and making sure every age group is motivated. If they are eligible to vote, they need to vote. You all, I know everyone on this call saw what happened in Jacksonville recently. We now have a Democratic woman who is running, who has won her seat as the mayor of this city. We also have a um, woman who will, a Democratic woman who will be leading the property appraiser's office. And we have a number of other candidates, Democratic candidates that won their races. The reason I brought that up to you is to make sure you all understand the work has to be done because what folks mostly don't know is that the Democrats did not elect this mayor. I am telling you, she had crossover appeal. Our Republican counterparts were sick of what was happening in Jacksonville and they came out. The challenge I have with that statement I just made to you is our people should be coming out and our Democrats should have elected wholeheartedly and in large numbers this mayor that we have now. And so there's work to be done in every county. So I know it's uh, we're talking Broward tonight, but there's work, to, real work to be done in every county. And it shouldn't be said when a county elects, a red county elects a Democratic mayor that we had to depend on our counterparts to help her get across the finish line. So it's our job to do that. Um, I'm here as a partner in this with you. And you're right, you have warriors in Tallahassee and we will continue to fight for you and the other people we serve across this great state. Thank you. And Senator Osgood. Thank you, Madam President. I wanna start again by thanking you for your incredible leadership. Um, the Broward branch in conjunction with our state president, my beloved Sara Adora was the first group to come to the Capitol, to have a presence, to come to Tallahassee, to have a breakfast, to make a presence, to make a statement. That's very important to us. They need to see other people of color in our property. We own the Capitol. It's our building, our facilities. So thank you for the organization of that. And all throughout the session, we had branches of the NAACP that were there up at the Capitol. That's very, very important. Finally, real quickly, I want to just say the gun bill is not in law yet. 
if you have your gun now, this is not a open carry. When it comes into effect on July 1st, you cannot just walk around with the gun. You can't have it on the car seat. Please, if you're gonna own a gun, lock it up so the babies don't get the guns and take them to school and get arrested. It's not an open carry. You have to conceal the gun. So you can't just be riding in the car. I was on a Zoom with some law enforcement people. They say it needs to be in your trunk or in the glove compartment or something. So please pay attention to the gun laws. And also we work in partnership, the NAACP with Faith in Florida who will start the first Monday in June with a series of town hall meetings. All the organizations will continue to do these meetings because it's important that you understand these laws and that you're prepared to respond to them. And that we begin now thinking about amendment and legislation that you can give us to take back to Tallahassee during the next session to get some of these things changed or to file new laws and new bills. I'm going to drop um, a link in the chat that you can sign up for the additional forms that will go through just like this and break down different bills. I know. Madam President has a lot more things that we're going to be doing as well. But please, and at finally, thank all of you for your time. Those of you that have joined us tonight, it's very important that we spend the time understanding legislation. And now we need you to go share what you've learned and heard tonight with at least three other people so that we continue to work across our community. On June 10th at 1 p.m., I need you to meet me at the African-American Research Library. We will be there talking about the Live Local Housing Bill and connecting you to the monies that came through that bill, over $811 million. A good chunk of it is coming to Broward County to help with affordable housing, multifamily housing, first time um, home buyers money, as well as information to tell you if you need repairs on your home. And the, the income um, category has been increased. So a lot of the middle class people are now qualified for these funds and these dollars. It's the first time the Sadowski Fund has been fully filled. And what we cannot happen is for them to put this money out there and then come back and tell us that the money wasn't used, that the people didn't use the money. So we want to help connect you and make sure that we're grassroots on the ground making sure that this money that was good that came forward, that people of color, I get asked all the time, why do you keep talking about black people? I'm a professional at being black. I've been black all my life. So I have to talk about black people if no one else is talking about black people. Thank you again, Madam President. And a shout out to Zeta Rowe. Y'all know I'm petty. I count it. It's 23 of y'all on this Zoom. That makes me really happy. I know we got some other stuff going on tonight, but Y'all keep y'all president really happy with the way that y'all engage. Thank you, Senator. We wanna make sure you all remember that the travel advisory is a travel advisory. It is an educational tool. It is a call to action. Don't get fooled about the tourism and that sort of thing. Every, all members of the D9, I can tell you that the National Bar Association, that the, the, the uh, Shriners, that the uh, Teamsters, um, and uh, most other organizations that you could think of, and particularly the Black ones, don't get fooled because they're coming here. They are contractually required to come, and we're not asking anybody to lose money. But you'll see more action as you go on. Um, there are going to be, we're on a partner's call last night. Many of your national presidents were on that call. Members of your grand council were on. And I can assure you that uh, those organizations are all in when it comes to this travel advisory that's going to educate folk on what's going on in Florida and the call to action to make sure that the rest of the United States, that America does not look, be, look like Florida as we move forward. We're asking you that if you have not joined the Fight for Freedom, do so. You can join on our website at naacpftlbroward.com. You can also join uh, the uh, Miami-Dade and in the River, wherever you are. Please make sure that you join. The only thing missing from this struggle is you. Uh, the National Office will be conducting a number of uh, trainings for third parties um, uh, on a monthly basis as we move forward 
um, as was explained to uh, the national presidents and other organizations on last night. We will make sure that that information gets out um, to all of our all of our partners and those potential partners as well. Um, but remember, not a travel ban. Don't let the other side fool you. Um, it's our lives is not a joke to us. It's not a stunt. This is a well thought out plan. And so you'll see the um, next steps coming forward uh, shortly. Um, and we will continue to move and su certainly support uh, uh, Black legislators. They have been there for, have been here for us, and we will continue to be there for them. Notice that we have uh, filed another lawsuit. We, I think this is number seven, and we have two on deck. Um, and so we are very serious about um, the, the freedoms of our people and, and certainly um, our people of color. Um, and, and yes, the LGBTQ community, because there's what is the parable that when they came for when they came for them, I, I did nothing. And I looked around, and there was nobody to come for me. So with this hate that's going on, we've got to be the voice. I mean, with that, I'm going to ask Minister Bridget Edwards, um, if you will close us out. Minister Edwards, please. Thank you, Madam President. And greetings to my cousin and welcome to President Anthony Tony Brown. Good to see him. Let us go to the throne of grace. Gracious Father, we are so grateful for you tonight. God, we thank you for what you have allowed us to accomplish here tonight, for what our ears have heard. Father, for what our eyes have seen. We pray now, God, that you would allow us to remain together. Help us to stay together, God, and to stay in the fight. God, we thank you now and we lift up before you. We pray, God, for Senator Osgood and for Senator Davis. We ask that you would crown them with courage, knowledge, strength, and wisdom. God, we pray that you would allow the NAACP, the Divine Nine, the senators, and every person on this call to remain together, a team united under your banner for the call of justice. It is your work. God, as we prepare to depart from this call, but never from your presence, we pray eternal God that you would allow your sweet Holy Spirit to rest, rule, and abide with these thy people henceforth now and forevermore. And all of God's children say amen. Have a good night. Amen. Thank you, Senator Davis. Thank you, Senator Osgood. And thank you all who have joined us this evening. Have a good day.